You are listening to Literacy, a lecture that is part of the Applied Linguistics program at Macquarie University, taught by Ingrid Piller and part of the Language on the Move network. Last week we spoke about the great diversity of scripts and writing system and today we are going to focus on one of these scripts in particular, the Latin alphabet. Why do I single out the Latin alphabet, you may say? Well, because it's a veritable superpower amongst scripts. One way to look at, to understand what I mean by the Latin alphabet is a superpower among scripts, is to look at the number of languages in the world and the largest numbers and their speakers. So what you've got here on this table is actually the top 15 languages or so that have the largest numbers of L1 and L2 speakers. Don't focus in too great detail on um, the actual numbers. We don't want to overthink this. There is, of course, all the problems around definition of who is an L1 speaker, who is an L2 speaker. That's not what I'm interested in at the moment. What I'm interested in is um, to have a look just at what the large numbers are. They're English, Chinese, Hindi, Spanish, French, Arabic, Bengali, Russian, Portuguese, Indonesian, Urdu, German, Japanese, Swahili. As you look at the list of these names, I've read this of the column that says English language name, take a look at the language name in the actual language. And one thing that you will notice there is that a fair number of the largest and most important languages on the world actually use the Latin script. So the Latin script reaches across more speakers or language users in the world than any other script, and it reaches across many more languages than any other script. Another way of looking at the superpower status of the Latin script is to look at a map of the world and to identify all those countries where a language that uses the Latin script, in many cases this is English, but also French, Spanish, Portuguese, and a great variety of other languages. So identify those countries where a language that uses the Latin script has official status. That's all the countries in dark green. Then in light green, you have those countries where a language that uses the Latin script has co-official status along with a language that uses another script. And then um, you have the gray countries which where English or English, excuse me, I'm not talking about English. I'm, I'm talking about the Latin script where the a language that uses the Latin script has no official status. However, that's um, to think all oh, the Latin script does not exist in those gray countries um, or colored gray countries that would certainly be misleading. Um, in many of those countries, English, and I'm talking about English, plays an important role as a global language. Um, it's widely learned. That's, for instance, true in China, which actually has the fifth largest number of English speakers in the world. Um, the largest number of English speakers are in the USA and then Nigeria, uh, Pakistan, India, and then you have a large number of English language speakers in China. So um, the Latin script plays a role there through um, English. It also plays an important role through Pinyin, which is kind of a support system to learn characters. Um, in Algeria, another big country in North Africa, French has a very important status. So it seems like the Latin alphabet is really found all over the world. And one of the reasons it is so universal is actually its use in international communication. Let's look at the 
Vienna Convention on Road Signs and Signals from 1968, for instance. This convention stipulates that in all countries where a script, a language other that doesn't use the Latin script is used, the inscription of words on information signs, and that's all the road signs, as in this example, for instance, the example in the image is from Sheikh Syed Road in Dubai, and you see that you have um, the place names, Jebel Ali and Abu Dhabi in um, Arabic, in the Arabic script, but uh, which is written from right to left. And then um, you have all these place names, Jebel Ali and Abu Dhabi also in the Latin script. So that just follows international conventions that to um, read out the stipulation of the convention in countries not using the Latin alphabet shall be both in the national language and in the form of a transliteration into the Latin alphabet, reproducing as closely as possible the pronunciation in the national language. And through these road signs in cities around the world, even where um, a language that uses the Latin script has no official role, you really see the Latin script pretty much globally. Another reason you see the Latin script in so many places is that not only official state signs like these road signs are in urban areas, certainly, or in tourist areas provided bilingually, but that this is also true of all kinds of other signs. For instance, um, I took this image at Tamathat University in Thailand, and um, you see that there is um, the the name of the university is there in the Thai script, but it's also there in English. And um, that's not at all unusual, but this present, this bilingual sign inscribes a presence of the Latin script in Thailand, where um, a Latin based script does not enjoy official status. So you can still see the Latin script all over Bangkok. Yet another example why the Latin script is so pervasive around the world is actually through advertising. I took this advertising, uh, uh, I took an image of this particular sign in Wuhan in 2012 in China. And um, the Busan brand is a famous brand of men clothing that's pretty much restricted to China. And, um, but even so, the brand name is again in two, available in two scripts, in the Chinese script and the Latin script. And through the presence of the brand name, we have a significant presence of um, the Latin script in China here. Yet another example, graffiti. So we've covered all kinds of areas that bring the Latin script to places where we wouldn't expect it. This image I took in a place where I certainly didn't expect to encounter the Latin script. Um, these are graffitis. Um, I think what it, me, what it says is I kiss love, although kiss seems to be a bit misspelled. I took this image at a, sh a very, um, a, a shrine in northern Iran in the Alborz Mountains. This is a very remote area. It takes about, um, you know, it takes a couple of hours of hiking. There is no way there to get to get there by car. So you really have to walk on foot and um, to visit this particular shrine and um, far away from, you know, it seems like the big world, far away from globalization, far away from English, far away from the Latin script in a country where the Latin script does not enjoy any official status. Um, there it is, a graffiti that draws on 
the power of English here, I think, but concomitantly, of course, brings Latin into the landscape of these remote Alborz mountains. The story I've told you so far is one of the incredible spread of the Latin alphabet. Now, um, maybe you're saying, yeah, but that's the spread of Latin that's really reaching the furthest corners of the globe is maybe coming to an end today because we're all going back using or forward, I don't know, to using emoji. And um, emoji do, uh, do away with scripts and writing system altogether. Well, not quite. The code behind emoji, Unicode, is also a code that is based on the Latin script. So the codes you have here, like U plus 1F600 for the smiley face, that code, the U's and the F's, is actually a Latin script based code. And um, Unicode is now available to actually encode all kinds of scripts, but the code behind all those scripts that we see on our digital screens still relies on the Latin script. So to sum this up, the Latin script is pretty much ubiquitous. It is a juggernaut. It is a linguistic giant. And what I'd like to understand today is how it got that status and what happens to a language when it kind of succumbs to the power of the Latin alphabet. The story of the spread of Latin is quickly told. There are basically three steps in the spread of the Latin script. The first one, at around the beginning of the Common Era, is the spread with the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, an empire centered around the Mediterranean with um, headquartered in Rome, in Italy, used the Latin language and the Latin language was written in the Latin alphabet. So the first leg up that the Latin alphabet got through the Latin language was through the Roman Empire. After the fall of the Roman Empire, Latin continued to spread through the Catholic Church. Now, the Catholic Church brought both the Latin language and the Latin script into um, pretty much all of Western Europe. And now here we need to start making a distinction already. So the Latin script started to continue to um, continue to spread with the Latin language, which was the official language of the Catholic Church. However, at this time in the Middle Ages, the Latin script also started to be used for the vernacular languages of Europe. So Lat the Latin alphabet at this time became the script in which not only Latin was written, but also languages like French, Spanish, English, German, all those Western European languages. The um, red line that you see here on um, the map, the schism of 1055, distinguishes um, the Roman Catholic, Roman Catholic Western Europe from Eastern Orthodox Christianity. And to this day, the line between Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy is actually also marked by a difference in script. Whereas Eastern Europe has the Cyrillic script, um, the Western Europe used the Latin script. So um, the Catholic Church, the spread of Christianity was the second step in the spread of the Latin alphabet. And then the Latin script went global with colonization um, what you see here is the various European empires that, you know, colonize pretty much everything in the world at one point or another. So um, the bits in red uh, were parts of the British Empire. So um, 
English spread there and because by that time the Latin script was the language in which English was written, that meant um, the Latin script spread with English. Um, then you have in yellow the Spanish Empire, so um, Spanish and with it the Latin script spread to all of Latin America or most of Latin America with the exception of Brazil, which was a Portuguese possession and so Portuguese spread. But um, like Spanish, like English, like French, it was writ these languages were all written in the Latin script and so basically colonialism was the final boost, if that's what you can call it, for the Latin script. Now, the Latin script, the, the expansion of the Latin script has not ended yet. Um, there are still, there continue to be switches to the Latin script to this very day. Only in 2015, a couple of years ago, um, Kazakhstan in Central Asia switch, decided to switch over from the Cyrillic script to the Latin script and these kinds of cases continue on and on. So um, we certainly haven't seen the end of the Latin alphabet and if you think that the English language is a juggernaut, well, there is an even bigger juggernaut behind the English language and that is actually the Latin alphabet. So now that I've told you the story of why the Latin alphabet spread, pretty straightforward, let's look at where the Latin alphabet actually came from. As you will know from last week's lecture, the Romans did not invent writing. They didn't invent the Latin alphabet. They adapted an existing alphabet. Now we need to go back to the Phoenicians the Phoenicians were um, a trading culture about who we actually know fairly little, who were based in three city-states of um, Biblon, Sidon and Tyre in um, the Eastern Mediterranean, the area that is today um, Lebanon and Israel. In the period of around 1200 to 800 before the Common Era, the Phoenicians established vast trading networks and you see that in um, these red lines and the white dots are all kind of trading colonies that they established um, along the Mediterranean. And um, the Phoenicians started their own alphabet. Initially, they um, we have documents that were written in cuneiform, but then um, at some point we see inscriptions where something new has happened and um, I've shown you some of those images. Those, um, their alphabet clearly was not inspired by cuneiform but by Egyptian hieroglyphics and so they adapted those hieroglyphics to record the consonants of their language. Phoenici the Phoenicians used a Semitic language like um, Arabic, like um, Hebrew, where um, consonantal roots are really important for the derivation of words. And so having a um, consonantal alphabet made really a whole lot of sense to them. The reason they started a new alphabet is probably Again, the reasons I gave you last week, like record keeping, information processing, as traders, they needed to know how much cargo they had shipped off from Byblos to Carthage or um, how many pints of wine or I don't know in which caskets they stored wine at the time they were receiving from Sicily and so on and so forth. So for a trading nation, record keeping is really important so that they would be major users of writing is not surprising at all. Now, as I also said, the Phoenician script probably is the basis for most of the um, scripts used in still in use today other than the Chinese script really and um, one of these 
descendants of the Phoenician alphabet is actually the Latin alphabet. Latin is not the only descendant of the Phoenician abjad, and there are actually three important lines of transmission. So we have Phoenician around 1000 before the Common Era, operating in the Eastern Mediterranean in particular. And first on, they inspired another script, the Aramaic script. Um, the Aramaic script became really important um, administrative script for a variety of languages now already um, across the Middle East for, um, for a couple of centuries up until the early centuries of the Common Era. The inscription, that, the stone inscription that you've got here in the image was found in Saudi Arabia. It dates from the 5th century before the Common Era and is a praise to a god. Aramaic is also important not only for um, its role at the time, but also because it became the ancestor of contemporary Arabic which is the script that is used um, across much of the Arab world, the Muslim world, the Middle East. So first line of transmission from Phoenician to Arabic. The second line of transmission, and I've shaded this a bit because it's a really debated and much more complex history and I don't really have time to go into the details here, but the second line of transmission is the Phoenician alphabet kind of goes east. Um, and becomes the forerunner of the Brahmi scripts. The inscription that you've got here in the example is from the Ashoka pillars and dates from the third century before the Common Era. The Brahmi scripts pretty much emerged fully formed in India at around this time, or well, that's we, that's in the surviving documents. It was first used for Sanskrit and then became the ancestor of all the various script systems of the subcontinent of the Indian subcontinent and even further east in Southeast Asia. The Brahmi scripts interestingly spread with Buddhism. So we have a second line of the relationship between script and religion. So I've told you the Arabic script is strongly related to Islam. The Brahmi scripts are related to the spread of Buddhism. And already earlier, I told you that the spread of the Latin script is related to Christianity. So let's now move on to the Latin script and go back west, the Phoenician alphabet also looked west, first inspired the Greek alphabet and the Greek passed on this newfound knowledge to the Romans and that's where the Latin alphabet basically started. One of the major transitions that happened from between in the transmission from the Phoenician alphabet to the Greek alphabet is that the Phoenician abjad, a consonantal alphabet, became a fully fledged alphabet when it was used as the Greek alphabet. And by fully fledged, I mean that it recorded not only consonants, but also vowels. Here you've got um, an overview of the Phoenician abjad. You've also got um, one of the earliest inscriptions that we know um, that we have in the Phoenician abjad. It's a um, tombstone. Let's have a look at this alphabet. One of the most amazing things about this alphabet, although we clearly can't recognize the signs anymore if we haven't specifically studied um, the script, is that actually the order of the letters is still fairly similar to the order of the letters in the Latin alphabet. So um, B, C, D, H, then bit of confusion, K, L, M, N, and then we go to the next line, P, S, 
R, well, R and S are switched around, T. So there is a bit of confusion, of course, and things have changed, but there is also still this basic order that is recognizable. And I think that's pretty amazing if you think that the transmission of this order of the letters you know, dates from like 3000 years ago. So we have 200 generations or so. Okay, the Phoenician abjad consonantal alphabet becomes a fully voweled alphabet. Now, how did that happen? Let me just go on a little detour here about scholarship on writing systems. For up until fairly recently, scholarship on writing systems has been a bit, let's say, chauvinistic or Eurocentric. And there was this assumption that there was a straight line of improvement, that each alphabet or each writing system that derived from another writing system was an improvement over the previous writing system and so that we basically have a progressive line of continuous improvement and in this kind of thinking the latin alphabet would be like the pinnacle of human achievement it's the best alphabet that there is and um, yeah continuous line of progress as I will go on to tell you shortly, that's actually not really the case. And um, even if we just look at English spelling, um, there is a lot, there are a lot of shortcomings in English spelling, let's put it that way. So um, this idea that there is a continuous line of progress from one alphabet to the other is really no longer tenable. However, so the idea was that when the Greeks took over the Phoenician abjad, they improved it and they had this genius idea that uh, what this alphabet needs to become even better than it already is, it, it needs to add vowels. Now, of course, no one knows because we can't go back in history and don't really know exactly how this inspiration happened. However, I have my own theory and I'll tell you, my theory is inspired from my research in second language acquisition. Because what must have happened is that um, a Greek second language speaker of Phoenician took over the script, right? So there was a bilingual person and I imagine that bilingual person was um, stronger in Greek and maybe not so strong in Phoenician. One thing that's really difficult for second language speakers, as we all know, is um, pronunciation. Of course, we often talk about the you know, pronunciation learning and um, differences in pronunciation. One thing that um, is the hardest is if um, language has a sound that doesn't exist in your native language. And it's hard to um, learn how to pronounce that sound. It's even hard to learn how to perceive that sound. And um, the first letter in the Phoenician abjad is a glottal stop. The glottal stop is actually a really tricky little sound. I can't do it very well because it doesn't exist in any of the languages I can do very well. Um, and the only w and it doesn't exist in Greek either. So that's the next important point. So this glottal stop. In order to say, you can't just say a glottal stop, right? You, you go some, and you can't just say a consonant. Whenever you point out a consonant, you need to add a vowel. You can't just say, mm, you know, you, you need the vowel sound to go with it, to um, make it full, to make it pronounceable. And uh, in outside of like phonetic studies, we don't even attempt to say just consonants. So there is this really tricky glottal stop. That's the first letter in the Phoenician abjad. 
So imagine some Phoenician trader sits down with his Greek trading partner and says, look, here's our alphabet. This is how we do it. And he goes, the first letter is, uh, is A. Uh. And then we have B. And then we have C or, or G. And so he goes on like that. And what the Greek person hears is not that there was a glottal stop on the first letter. He just hears the vowel that completes the pronunciation of the glottal stop. And through a very fortuitous intercultural misunderstanding due to pronunciation differences and the difficulties of perception in second languages, voila, we have the fully voweled alphabet. That's just my story. Now let's move on to the actual point of our story today, the Latin alphabet. The classical Latin alphabet was, had 23 letters. You find them all here. It was only written in capital letters. And so you have here the famous inscription that was all over the Roman Empire um, by the Senate and the people of Rome. I won't dwell too much on the actual relationship between the Latin alphabet and um, the Latin language, except to say that there was a really excellent match between the Latin alphabet and the Latin language. So the Latin alphabet, when it was adapted by the Romans from the Greeks, and going back through all those lines of transmission, they did a really good job of adapting these letters to the sounds of their language. So in that sense, maybe the la classical Latin alphabet was a pinnacle of human achievement at some point in time. However, as I told you, as, as you know, the Latin language is dead, so no one speaks Latin anymore. Nowadays, all that survives of the Latin alphabet is, uh, all that, uh, that survives of Latin is the inheritance it has bequeathed to pretty much all of humanity, its alphabet. And now, the next question that I want to address in this lecture is actually what happens when you squeeze the alphabet that is very well suited to one language, the Latin language in this case, into so many different other languages. What happens is actually nicely encapsulated in this um, meme of boyfriend looking at another girl. Uh, boyfriend in the meme is Polish, which uses the Latin alphabet, but could just as well use the Cyrillic alphabet, which is specifically designed for the phonology of Slavic languages. Basically, what happens when you transfer one alphabet, holus bolus, onto another language is you get a mismatch between the phonology of that language and the writing system. And that's why in former times, actually, people kept adapting the alphabet or the, whenever they took over a writing system, as, we, as I showed you in this um, diagram of the descendants of the Phoenician alphabet, there was a lot of adaptation. The Romans adapted the alphabet that they took over from the Greeks to their own needs. They adapted it to their language. That kind of adaptation really pretty much stopped when um, the Latin alphabet was taken over for the European languages. And um, that created all kinds of unfortunate mismatches. The first kind of mismatch to contend with was that um, the Latin alphabet had 23 letters, 23 phonemes, pretty good match. Um, but 
as it was adapted to other languages, it had to contend with a larger number of phonemes or different phonology. One way to deal with that initially was to add additional letters. So um, English, for instance, has 26 letters as opposed to the 20 or original 23. The U, the W and the J was added. And um, pangrams, by the way, are nifty little mnemonics that are nonsense sentences that try to be as efficient as possible by using all the letters of used in an alphabet. So the famous English pangram is the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Another solution to this problem of different phonology is to add um, all kinds of diacritics, not only add additional letters, but um, mark different letters in different ways. So for instance, in German, you have these dots above some of the vowels that signal a different quality to the vowel, or um, the Polish diacritics that you've got here that signal different consonant qualities. An even greater problem is created when you don't only, only in quotation marks have to deal with a larger number of sounds, but you also have to deal with tonal languages. And that problem emerged once the Latin alphabet spread outside, was adapted to languages outside Europe, as in the case of Vietnamese, for instance, where we can sort of really ask this question, are there 29 letters or are there 89 if we include all the various tone markers? Okay, let's look specifically at English now. As I told you, 26 letters already added three from the original 23 Latin. And these are now supposed to be mapped onto 19 vowels and 24 consonants. That's a pretty bad mismatch, as you can see. So we have um, 43 phonemes in English that need, if we had an ideal alphabet, we had 43 letters. But we don't have an ideal alphabet. We have 43 phonemes and we have 26 letters. That creates a range of problems. One way this problem has been solved is through the use of graphs. A digraph is basically a combination of two letters that work like one grapheme. So the letter combination stands for one sound. That is a reasonable solution, works in English to a certain extent, except unfortunately that they didn't do it consistently. As you can see, some of the digraphs in English, um, like double O for instance, stand for two different phonemes. So double O can stand for short U as in book and hook or for long U as in moon and room. The same is true of the combination of E and A which can stand for head and bread or it can stand for the vowel in read and bead. Another example of this kind of you know, confusion and double use is um, the combination of OW, which can be used for the diphthong in toe and mo, or for the one in cow and now. That creates all kinds of problems, this adaptation. And, um, one sort of these problems that we see a lot in English are homophones and homographs. A homophone is 
are words that are pronounced in the same way, but spelled in different ways. So um, the example that I've got here all are, um, you know, very basic English words. Um, and when you spell these words, you always have to make a semantic decision in your head. Um, am I talking about myself right now, in which case I need to just use the large I, or am I talking about um, the um, I, the, the organ of vision, in which case it is spelled E-Y-E. -E. So lots of those homophones, different words that are um, different, same sounding words that are spelt differently. The opposite of this are homographs. A homograph is um, two different words again, but they are spelt in the same way, but pronounced differently. So we have attribute and attribute, bow and bow, invalid and invalid, and so on and so forth. And so on and so forth. So um, there is a lot of potential for confusion in the English language. And that all goes back to the founding problem, if you will. The founding problem is the adaptation of an alphabet that was not really suited to the English language because it had a far number, because it was built on the logic of an alphabet which matches sounds and letters, but that logic could not be systematically carried through as there was a mismatch and a significant mismatch between the number of letters available in the Latin alphabet and the number of phonemes in the English language that needed to be you know, expressed in writing. Because this is all so confusing, of course, all kinds of jokes about the English, English spelling abound. I've got a couple here off the internet. Um, there is, for instance, this one about the 10 pronunciations of O-U-G-H. So O-U-G-H in the English system is actually one grapheme. It is made up of four letters, but it combines to stand for one sound. Except it does not only stand for one sound, it stands for 10 or can stand potentially for 10 different sounds as in this little neat little sentence, which um, you can read out for yourself and try whether it works. I know from previous experience that the word that causes the most difficulty is the fifth one. And so I will read it out to you after all, but I'll just give you a second to try it out for yourself. Okay. Were you able to get all the 10 right? I thought it would be rough to plow through the slough, though it was falling into the loch that left me thoroughly coughing and hiccuping. This is also confusing that George Bernard Shaw at one point quipped that you could just as well in the logic of English spell the word for fish as G-H-O-T-I. How would that work? Again, I'll give you a bit to think about it. When is G hedge? And we've got um, a clue in the, in the sentence that we just looked at. When is G hedge pronounced as F, O as E, and T I as SH? Well, here is the solution. GH is pronounced F in enough or tough. O is pronounced E in women. And TI is pronounced as sh in nation or motion. 
So yes, some outliers there as um, O for E in women, really unusual, um, but also some regularities there. And then there is this one, which I won't even try to read out for you, um, also pulled off the internet. Um, you could really spell potato according to this little joke, if that's what it is. You could spell potato as G hedge O U G hedge P hedge T hedge E I G hedge T T E E A U. Well, if G hedge stands for P as in hiccup. If O U G H stands for O as in Do, if P H T H stands for T as in Tysis, if you don't know what Tysis is, you're forgiven. It's um, uh, pulmonary. It's a technical term, medical term for pulmonary tuberculosis. If E I G H stands for A as in eight, if T T E stands for T as in Gazette, if E A U stands for O as in Plateau, then the right way to spell potato should be Yeah, this long little thing. Now, is this just all too weird? Should we just turn our back on English spelling, throw our hands up in despair and give up? No, you don't have to give up. You don't have to throw up your hands in despair. The examples I've just given you are from the fringes. They're very peripheral and um, don't really, you know, apply to the logic of the system. There certainly is a core of English spelling that is fairly logical and systematic and particularly makes sense if you understand or know a bit about the history of the English language and understand how the Latin alphabet was taken over into the language and how English is also the product of many, many forms of language contact and a great variety of social and historical for forces. Let me exemplify this to you with the spelling for the phonemes of voiceless and voiced S in English. To begin with, in Old English, so that was the language that was spoken before 1066, before the Norman invasion, before um, the French influence on the English language became really strong. So in that Old English, voiceless and voiced S were pronunciation variants. They weren't phonemes. So they did not distinguish meaning. They occurred um, next to each other. In modern English, however, S, voiceless S and voiced S are phonemes. The example I've got here is um, C's and C's. Now, C's and C's looks not too bad because um, the voiceless S that is pronounced voiceless is actually spelt with um, S and um, the voiced S is spelt with Z. So that's good, except that's very rare. That's not the pattern. That's the pattern we would expect in a true alphabet, right? Um, but English really doesn't have a true alphabet. So um, the S is used, the letter S is used a lot, both for voiceless and voiced S, as in um, loose and loose, um, the house and to house. So all these variations where we have a um, pair of voiceless and voiced, we have the same letter that is used to express these two or to record these two different sounds. Now, 
at some point someone must have thought um, well let's make this a bit more systematic and so they added the French pattern where um, CE is used for S uh, for voiceless S and SE is used for voiced S and that gives us in English the um, distinction between advice, the noun, and to advise, the verb, with the voiced S. But that really in many ways just increased the confusion because it made the pattern even less clear and particularly as this kind of pattern was then also inserted into um, Old English Anglo-Saxon words that had nothing to do with French as in the example of mouse and mice. Both are, uh, both are voiceless S but um, you know although both same stem, same sound, two different spellings. Um, although you can see some systematicity here and it's not as crazy as in the memes I gave you earlier, it still is very confusing. Now, um, the only thing that kind of saves this all are quantity patterns. And now let me explain those to you. So the pattern to watch out for and the pattern that you can use in your teaching when your students tell you, oh no, this is too difficult. How will I ever learn how to spell in English? Is actually that one thing that we need in English and that has nothing to do with pronunciation and that's where we actually see that the Latin alphabet for the English language is no longer purely an alphabet but moves towards a logographic writing system as we need to mark the plural and we need a plural marker so very often the um, the plural is marked in spelling differently from non-inflectional word final voiceless s. The plural in English in around 80% of all cases, that is after vowels and after voiced consonants, that plural is pronounced as a voiced s. And in a smaller minority of cases, around 20%, it is a voiceless consonant. So keep that quantity pattern 80%, 20% in mind. This, is this all is complicated by the fact that many non-inflected words end in S. And so what we really need in English to make things convenient for the reader and ultimately one thing and we'll get to that again later one thing that is really important about a writing system is the speed with which it can be read the point of learning how to read and write is to acquire reading speed and reading speed would be quite impeded if you often have to make a distinction between uh, is this word now a plural or is this word actually something else is you know am i looking at peas the plural or am i looking at peace am i looking at sins or am i looking at sins so the key need for spelling is to actually distinguish between voiced set in inflection, voiced s in inflections, from um, voiceless s in similar non-inflectional positions, and that what's what the English spelling actually does quite systematically. So we have the s spelling for all the plurals, and in cases where the plur where the word doesn't have 
a plural where the final word final s is not plural then we have the french pattern ce and that's quite systematic and that's actually really helpful to all of us once we've learned it and once we've understood it as it allows us to read english fluently and quickly and that ultimately is the point of any writing system and the Latin alphabet does that today for many, many languages. Unsatisfactory as it sometimes is, and um, it's a make-do solution in many ways, but it is a very useful make-do solution and one that um, lots of people have worked to make it work in so many different languages. And that after all is an achievement too. It's a huge achievement to actually have a script that, trans that, that spans the globe in a way as the Latin alphabet does. Thank you for your attention.